Um, but my name is Sarah Jenkins. I'm the senior program manager for email at REI. Uh, if you're not familiar with REI, we're basically just a huge toy store for adults. It's my favorite way that people have explained that. Um, but we're an outdoor retailer. We're based in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have about 170 brick and mortar locations across the country. Uh, we also started a nonprofit in 2021. Uh, a lot of people don't actually know that. It's called REI Cooperative Action Fund, and it works to increase the outdoor access for more people. <coughs> it's already going. <coughs> uh, so we're incredibly focused on environmental impact and sustainability. Getting people outside is incredibly important to us, but actively protecting outdoor spaces where our customers are using our product also speaks to their as well as our values. Uh, but I wanted to start by just giving a quick level set on the structure of our email team at REI. So we have four branches, all of them supporting the email program. So we have strategy that focuses on messaging and content positioning. And then we have creative and analytics teams that support bringing the strategies um, to life and maintaining our customer data hygiene. We also have an internal dev team that codes and sends these emails out. Uh, and all of these teams work incredibly closely together to bring these emails to life. It's about uh, 19, 20 people in total. But today I'm going to talk about and just give some background on some challenges that we faced as an email channel uh, and an example of how we saw an opportunity during a highly competitive environment to increase our subscriber engagement and the value that we were offering to our customers and just hopefully leave you with some ideas on different ways to look at and to use data in email. So just to set the stage a little bit, uh, about three years ago, like a lot of other retailers, we were facing a ton of instability in supply chains and an overnight shift in how people were shopping for products. Because of restrictions, a lot of people were forced to start shopping digitally, which suddenly put a huge amount of pressure on the email channel to increase the connections with our customers, communicate updates, announce new product launches, and to support this newfound retail environment that had gone digital. At the same time, competition became a serious factor. So recreating in the outdoors became one of the only things that we could all do for a while, which for us at REI was fantastic. You can talk to anybody who works there and they can talk your ear off for hours. That is a warning, so please don't come talk to me about gear unless you have a lot of time on your hands. Um, but there was this captive audience that we had and whether they were excited about it or not, they were ready to learn about outdoor gear. Um, but at the same time, everybody from Amazon to Walmart were really ramping up how they were talking about out selling outdoor gear. Uh, and if we think about that with the statistic of customers being exposed to four to 10,000 ads per day, it's a lot of fatigue, it's a lot of noise, and so breaking through that really became a priority for us. But over time, we started to see friction emerging between best practices and business bottom lines. Email is so often viewed as a really fast and cheap way of getting messaging out to customers to see an immediate return on traffic and demand. And because of that pressure, we were starting to see signs of audience fatigue with impacts to our click-through rate as well as our engaged audience size. So we often think of top of inbox, top of mind as an increase in messaging, but we were seeing serious ramifications around doing that at scale. And with the environment that we were in, solving business gaps with more email wasn't going to be the answer. It was really sending better, not more. And we needed to deliver the right message at the right time, all while everyone else was talking about and doing and sending the exact same thing. So we took a look at one of our email programs. Its purpose was to use product to sustain and engage customers in an activity that we knew that they were interested in or were likely to be interested in based on our data modeling. And at the time, traffic and revenue around this program was dropping, but because we knew that the demand was there based on the uh, market shifts, we kept testing our creative and tweaking audience targeting, but we weren't seeing any impact. 
So one of the issues that we ended up identifying was that these emails were using products that merchants and we as a brand wanted people to buy. And that wasn't resonating as strongly as we expected with customers. And there's absolutely a time for businesses to pave the way and to be trendsetters with product, but without balancing that with more customer-guided journeys to stay on top of macro trends, we were really falling behind in this space. So this is where the opportunity came in, uh, and it was from all of this data. Um, all of it from this increase in competition and demand and decrease in engagement. And Morgan, I think it's going to help me, but I'm going to pause here just to open it up for a quick question. He does have some gift cards just to make this a little more fun. I know it's the morning. I have only have one left. <laughs> <laughs> Well, then you have to answer the question. <laughs> um, so, so think about it. So since 2020, so start of COVID, what new outdoor activity have you picked up and how did you go about figuring out what gear you needed or how to get into the sport? Um, so in 2020, oh. Katrina Wang, Overstock. Um, in 2020, I started kayaking because um, I figured it was like the perfect like pandemic safe sport. It's outside and also a little bit difficult to kayak within six feet of someone else. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so I started, that's how I started. Um, how I figured out what gear I needed. Um, Kayaking groups, like Facebook kayaking groups, honestly, for my area. I had no idea where to kayak. Uh, I live in Salt Lake City, Utah, so like, I don't, it doesn't seem like an obvious choice. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I did. Yeah, Facebook is a great resource. Oh, and I will say, um, if Facebook, like local kayaking groups, but also specifically a Facebook group for the kayak brand that I bought mm -hmm. um, is like my number one spot that I go to for gear recommendations. Yep. All right. You get a gift card. All right. Who else wants one? No. Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. I, I got into hiking more, and so then I ended up um, not realizing it before, but there's a whole bunch of sites with all the trails um, and that side of it, and that hiking shoes and running shoes are different. And so needing to have hiking shoes um, to have it be better on your feet when you go through it was my big aha, because I thought, I'm fine if I'm just using the same shoes I would use for running. Yeah. Who are you? Who are you? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Kelly Haggard from Synchrony. Southern California. <laughs> there you go. Just remember to introduce yourself. Uh, Chelsea with Advanced Auto Parts, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm already a very outdoorsy person, so there's really not a sport I haven't dabbled in. But one that I've purposely avoided is running. I. I hated it. I played soccer and I don't mind running with a purpose, but I just couldn't find running outside my door with a purpose. Um, but during COVID, working from home for so long, um, not interacting and feeling kind of trapped at times, um, there was something about putting on your sneakers and walking out your front door. And I live in uh, near Duke University. It's a very walkable area. I could just run for as long as I wanted to. and just kind of release all that tension. And during the summer and the spring, it's so beautiful outside to try to work out in your house and lift weights. It was kind of like, oh, it's so boring. Like I want to breathe fresh air and shake my body a little bit. And so people laugh, but I, I got into running because I just wanted to run away from work. Um, <laughs> and there was something really nice about just walking out my door and being like, see you later, I'm done. Um, so. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so, uh, same experience. So all three of you, I, I, millions, millions of people felt the same way and they were trying to get outside and trying to figure out how to go about doing that. Um, so 
this was, um, there was all of this data from the three of you, from millions of other people, um, and it was data from beyond just our subscribers, and they were browsing, they were searching keywords, all of it on our site, they were searching Google, and all of it was t uh, really telling us what was trending on digital from a macro perspective, and all of it was going untapped to better serve our subscribers with relevant trends in activities. So 81% of consumers will research online before making a purchase either digitally or in store. So all of this data was really at our fingertips, telling us exactly what was trending uh, and what our customers were shopping for and wanting. And that's regardless of whether they were subscribed for email or not. So in email, in order to personalize, we often look at one-to-one -one behavioral data on subscribers, but we realized that there was actually this plethora of data that we hadn't as an email channel really ever looked at before. Um, so we analyzed this data from all of these different channels, and instead we looked for trend patterns to emerge, to have all of these outdoor enthusiasts, whether they were our subscribers or not, to tell us what they were likely to start thinking about and to digitally shop for a product or an activity. It then allowed us to turn around and serve our email subscribers the most culturally relevant and trending product at the time when all of these data sources were aligning and to tell us um, was a time of peak interest. So by compiling and cross-referencing digital trends, we were able to map out consistent trends over time, but also to spot agile trends as they were happening. So times when there were spikes in interest that were well above historic trends that we wouldn't have been able to predict, and then get out in front of our customers quickly with that product to catch them in the moment that they start to think about it. So in this example, which is completely fake data, I know we have competitors in the room, this is totally fake. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but we looked at the crossover trends um, within each of these digital channels, um, in this case for water, um, and so in all of these different channels to track and to launch a water-based email at the best possible time when people were interested. So once we had identified the macro digital trend, we layered on behavioral personalization to speak directly to the individual. So trends are a really great way to stay relevant, but one-to-one -one behavioral data makes that trend personal. So in this example, when we knew that hiking was starting to gain traction, we versioned the images and the landing pages based on their geographic location to better reflect the environment that they'd be in when they opened the email and would be experiencing these products. So we also looked at their behavioral data. So in this example, if we knew that somebody was browsing or had purchased dog gear, we also showed them hiking gear for their dogs. We also showed local hiking classes and events, um, uh, only if they were located near a store. So this was a really great way to stay locally relevant and to encourage a deeper connection with the brand. <clears throat> Uh, we also have plans on the roadmap to personalize based on subscribers' purchase behavior. So whether they're per uh, browsing to purchase online or whether they're browsing to purchase in-store, especially as our subscribers start to get more comfortable with in-store shopping. So once we had dialed in on the trend data, we took a look at who we were talking to. So we started by scoring our entire audience based on behavioral flags that would tell us the likelihood of them con uh, continuing to engage with us in email. So this allowed us to identify the strongest opportunity group for re-engagement, but also the group that would be most responsive to this type of email. It allowed us to clear out the clutter for our unengaged group since we significantly reduced the touches we were sending to them so that we could focus on sending them the most relevant and engaging content without also sending them additional emails that they may have qualified for. It also really allowed us to identify the group of subscribers who could handle getting more emails and for us to be more liberal while still being relevant with what they were receiving and qualifying for. So with this shift in the program of leveraging trending product data over business curated product, we've decreased circulation by 21% overall by pulling out people that we determined as unengaged and decreasing the circulation for a lapsing audience. We also saw a 52% increase in demand and a 13% increase in traffic using this trending approach. 
And as we get better at mining this data and creating better modeling around it, especially for historic trends, we do expect these numbers to continue to rise. Um, but I do definitely want to call out some challenges that we faced with this approach. So one big challenge with using data in this way and something that is critical to watch out for are external cultural and environmental shifts, especially when using data to respond to agile trends. So in this example that actually happened, we were set to launch a rain gear email when California got hit by awful weather. Um, I think they called it an atmospheric river. It was so much rain, so much snow. Um, but by keeping a pulse on this, we were able to suppress customers in these areas. But it shows how a harmless email just using product that was trending could come off as incredibly insensitive for some and for us to lose brand loyalty. Um, it also comes with internal challenges as well. Uh, there's always a push and pull when it comes to working with other partners, especially when there are multiple stakeholders. Uh, I would love to say that this was an easy process to launch and that it's super efficient, um, but it's not. Uh, it's never easy, but by having open communication, clear goals, and constantly testing uh, and pointing back to data as the decision-making foundation, it helps to maintain internal alignment and really lets the results that lead to your goal speak for themselves. It also didn't come without surprises. Uh, at one point across all channels, there was such a strong spike in everything that was bear related. Every single one of us at REI was Googling about whether there was this massive increase in bear attacks that we had no idea about. It was weird. Um, but the surprises didn't just come from the product. It was also in when, un, uh, when paid and unpaid channel data worked best. And we absolutely saw stronger performance from some channels during certain times over others. So it's always important to test and to iterate on what does work, as well as continuously assess your audience demographics and behavior just to layer on channel expertise on if you think it will be effective. So just wrapping up, just a final thought to leave you with. Reaching beyond your subscriber data will help to build a more relevant and personalized program for your customers. Data doesn't always need to come from them to speak personally to them and their, in their interests in your industry. Uh, and lastly, don't <laughs> Google bear attacks. Uh, but if you do, I have some bear spray recommendations for you. <laughs> Sorry, Data Axel. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you so much. Any questions for Sarah? I know I've got a couple, including what am I going to find under Googling Bear Tech? <laughs> All right. Um, Anthony from Cordial um, out of Boulder, Colorado. So very familiar with REI, longtime member. Um, excellent presentation, by the way. My question for you is you talked about like layering on these macro trends of what's going on across these various different signals that you're picking up on and then personalizing those messages. Can you talk about like how you were doing the segmentation in that, for example, like if I have an affinity for cycling and hiking and there's a macro trend about something unrelated, did you do any sort of like vetting or segmentation before those went out? Yep. Um, so you mean if you were a cyclist and camp was trending, would I talk to you? Correct. Absolutely not. No. So um, our segmentation is really activity-based, so we pay very close attention to uh, what people are browsing, what people are purchasing. Um, we also have modeling available, so we look at the likelihood of you getting into the activity based on some other behavioral flags that we have. So no. So we, we take that macro trend. So we, you know there are times that we see bikes trending. Um, and then we take a look at the strongest possible audience. And that's where we're able to pull down that circulation to target the best possible audience um, and then increase the return on that. Uh, Ryan Phelan with RPE Origin. Over here. Hi. I was like, where are you? Where is that voice coming from? <laughs> um, great presentation. I, I, you did a really good job of laying out how you came about and what the results were and your struggles along the way. One thing that I caught, you talked about reducing your send volume by 21% attributed to non-engaged people. 
Okay, how did you win that argument inside of the organization to say, I want to send less to people that don't care, because that never happens. Yeah, it was, sure was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Any tips, tricks for the audience about how to get that? Because, I mean, that's been a struggle as a strategist and somebody in the industry. We've been talking about that for 20 years, mm -hmm. right? And every executive I've always talked to was like, but they would, they might, they might open the email. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's a, it's, it's a great point. Um, it was not easy at all, so I won't pretend that it was. Um, I think the approach that, that I took was really to divide it into three. So one is your most engaged audience. So who are the people that you know are going to respond to what you're talking about? You're gonna keep those people. <laughs> Uh, and then the second layer are the people where you're, you're seeing them leave. You're seeing that lapsing audience. Um, and it's <clears throat> really reducing the, ma the amount of emails that you're sending to them. If they're not opening your email, they're not clicking it, they don't need more. That's not going to be something that they're responding to. And so really it's, it's going to leadership and saying, look, just watch. And I literally said that, just, just watch. Um, and it's a trial period of a couple months where <clears throat> we were allowed to do this and really to pull circulation down. And if there were traffic impacts, we would have pulled back, but there wasn't. We started to see better engagement, especially when we reduced the frequency of that lapsing audience. They started to not see us so much, and so then they were like, oh, wait a second, what happened? And then in their inbox was this incredibly relevant content to them uh, that they opened and engaged with. Um, Olivia Dreda, Joanne Fabrics. Um, was interested about your um, personalization. Um, how did you manage to do what you're doing at scale with, um, how did that work in terms of like the extra workload on the, on the design teams and so on and making sure that, you know, that felt digestible for the teams? Yep, um, I'll give you two answers. <laughs> so one, what we do now, and two, what we're moving towards. So what we do now, it is manual. So if we are, in that example that I showed, if we're sending a hiking email, it is, it's, it's pulling out that creative and creating versions manually. But what we want to do and to move into is to a space where we're really working off of a module system. So we have modules in a huge database library where we're saying, this person lives in California. It's currently snowing because they're in Northern California. So show them an image that reflects that in a hiking environment. And then just overlay the, um, the headline and the copy. Hi there, Jimmy from Abercrombie and Kent. Um, you mentioned targeting your engaged audience and with all of the changes in the Apple Mail privacy policy and email engagement metrics kind of being skewed over the last few years, how are you approaching qualifying engaged groups? Yep, so we completely ignore opens. Uh, we look at traffic, so whether they click our, on our emails as well as if they purchase. So we do take a look. Um, we do have a lot of people who will click and engage with us. They won't purchase digitally, but they will purchase in store. But all of that data is available to us. So we'll attribute that to email. All right. Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you.